Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me here. I will be talking about um, the work that uh, my postdoc, uh, Nikolai Miklin, and I put on archive a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the title is Information Causality Without Concatenation. It's a problem that uh, I've been trying to solve for over a decade, and I am extremely thrilled that now we have uh, the, the solution. Um, so let, let me just start. So information causality is a, a principle that we uh, that we propose in this uh, paper that's um, that's referenced uh, at the bottom of the screen, and uh, it's very natural uh, information theoretic principle. So basically, it means that if there are two communicating parties, the total information potentially available to the receiver cannot exceed the whole information sent by the sender. This is sort of obvious. And also, if you look at um, uh, the limit, so if the sender is not sending any information, then the receiver should not get any information. So it's, in a sense, a generalization of no signaling principle. And this is how I wanted uh, to call it, but my co-authors said information causality would sound better. So uh, being more specific, if we have a, a protocol, which is uh, shown on the right-hand side of the screen, um, so uh, the sender is getting n numbers, which are random and independent, and she sends m classical bits to the receiver, then the total amount of information that the receiver has about all these numbers cannot exceed the size of the message. And this happens even if the receiver is somehow limited only to access a part of the data at the same time. So we, we, may, we may imagine that uh, the receiver is getting some, some sort of message. And uh, when he chooses to read the first uh, page, the second page disappears. And the other way around, if he chooses to read the second page, the first page disappears. But um, since he, in principle, can read both, and uh, the sender doesn't know what the receiver is going to send, there, there shouldn't be a way for uh, her to transfer more than the limit imposed by the channel. And this should hold even if the parties have access to some uh, non-local resources, uh, for, for example, uh, bell states or, or whatever. And, uh, now, this is very interesting because we were able to show that this simple principle has to hold not only in classical physics or in quantum mechanics, but in every possible physical theory where you can introduce uh, some sort of mutual information. And this, what I call some sort of mutual information, is just um, an expression which uh, uh, which has four basic principles. First, no signaling. It means that if there are two, uh, two parties and they do not communicate, then the, uh, the mutual information between their variables should be zero. Second is data processing inequality. I have it on the right hand side. So if through a Markov process, a is transformed to B and B to C, then obviously mutual information between A and B is smaller than between A and C. It, uh, so the, in the most um, uh, intuitive way to think about it is, is that if you have a book, you cannot increase the amount of information the book has by ripping off some pages. So, uh, the third uh, uh, property is that uh, if these objects um, that uh, are here, A and B, 
uh, in this uh, definition of mutual information are classical random variables, this mutual information should uh, be then identical to Shannon's mutual information. And the final is the chain rule. So basically the chain rule says that if you look at what information uh, A has about B and C, then it should be equal to all the information A has uh, about B plus all the information A has about C conditioned on B. And, and uh, if, this, um, if these properties are satisfied, then you can derive uh, this thing, which I have in this uh, blue rectangle here. Now, um, what, what we use this protocol for is that we consider uh, this principle for is we consider an information uh, processing protocol involving uh, something which we called a non-local box. So it's an, an imaginary object, object which is supposed to violate CHSH inequality. So we, Alice and Bob, they put some inputs, they observe outputs, they repeat their experiment many, many times, and they say, okay, we violated uh, CHSH Bell inequality, and maybe they violated it uh, up to Cyrilson bound, so as far as uh, quantum mechanics allows, or they violated it even more. And, um, and, if, uh, and if you look at this protocol and the equations I have below, let's assume that the, the probability that A plus B equals zero or, or one, uh, conditioned on, uh, on the inputs of Alice and Bob being equal to the indices of the probabilities is this, then if you have access to such a probability distribution, you can use it to violate CHSH inequality up to E. Then this is very easy to check. And now I'm, I'm not going into the details, but there exists a simple protocol um, which enables Bob, the receiver, to learn one of two numbers, A0 or A1, of Alice if they have access to such a box and a communication of one classical bit. Um, it doesn't matter what, what this uh, protocol is, it's uh, very easy, uh, you, you, you can check it in our paper. But the amazing thing is that obviously, if Bob were successful every time uh, in guessing one of Alice's numbers, then uh, in this formula that uh, I have here, both mutual informations would be one. And since we are sending only one classical bit, this inequality would be violated. This means that PR boxes do not satisfy information causality. And since I'm trying to convince you that this is a reasonable principle, they should not exist. Moreover, we, we can check how much noise we should add to PR boxes or how close we need to be to serial sum bound in order for these probabilities not to violate information causality. And if you look at this protocol, we, find, we found that this E, which is, um, which is basically the correlation function, has to be smaller or equal 0 0.78. So all the red part on this uh, arrow is excluded by information causality. While quantum mechanics allows you to go as high as 0 0.707. So there is a small gap between what information causality forbids and what quantum mechanics allow, allows. And uh, our goal was obviously to modify our protocol in such a way that we could use information causality to, to 
forbid any non-local box stronger than uh, the, mo uh, the most non-local quantum one. So we wanted uh, to basically get quantum band from information causality. And the idea we had how we can do this was using concatenation. And we thought we were pretty smart. We were really happy about this concatenation. And uh, my talk, at least the rest of it, will be about why we were actually very stupid to use this concatenation. So what is concatenation? If you look at information causality protocol, it's basically taking two numbers and encoding it into one number. So I take bits A0 and A1 here and encode it into one bit classical message. So what I can do is I can take two more copies of the, of the boxes. Uh, you, you have them on uh, the left-hand side of the screen now. Take four numbers. Each of them will encode uh, the information into a message. So I have two messages, but then I have, can use another layer uh, of the protocol, which is exactly as uh, uh, the, the same as the previous one, and then code these two messages into one message. So I get, um, I get four numbers uh, encoded into a, a single bit message. Now, it, it forbids even more non-local boxes. And if you repeat concatenation many, many, many times, in the limit of infinity, you get the quantum bound. And this made us very, very happy and somehow forced us to assume that concatenation is the way uh, to work with information causality. So, so this principle was, was uh, it was quite successful. There were some follow papers and citations, and we were very, very happy. And, uh, and in basically all follow ups, concatenation was used, but it was used at some cost. So I, 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 I say here at what costs. And uh, this, uh, this uh, hashtags, they, they mean that. If I have two numbers being encoded, they have to have the same size, the same alphabet, and also they have to have the same size, size as the alphabet of the message. If they are not, I cannot take messages and encode them using the same protocol. The same here in the decoding uh, scheme, the size of the input for uh, Bob has to be at least pro, uh, proportional a power of the size of the output. Also, since I'm using independent boxes uh, in upper layers of the protocol, these numbers have to be independent. So what this caused was that uh, information causality could be applied only to very few Bell inequalities and with limited success. So, can we do something about this? And uh, really, for a decade, we thought no, but recently we had a breakthrough. So if you look at uh, how uh, the information uh, causality bound is derived, you can actually get something stronger than M on the right-hand side. So it's not the size of the message. If you re really repeat the calculations, you will see that what is bounding the total potential information is mutual information between input and output of the communication, uh, classical communications channel. So if Alice and Bob are communicating with some channel, uh, it uh, has a capacity which upper bounds uh, mutual information between input and output, and this capacity is equal to n, uh, the number of bits being sent, only in the case of the channel being identity channel. So now we ask, OK, what would be the bound for uh, flowing from information causality 
if we just have a single copy of the box, but Alice and Bob are communicating via symmetric noisy channel. And uh, we have a plot here from our ar archive paper. And uh, it shows that if the channel gets more noisy, the bound goes to basically 0 0.84, which is, uh, which is the expression of, uh, which is basically the Tsegelson bound. So previously um, we were using, uh, we were using this correlation function E as uh, a Tsegelson bound, but if you take one half of one plus 0 0.84, 0, 07, then you will get everything uh, expressed in the terms of probabilities and you get exactly this bound. So we can, with just single box, um, re-derive results from that paper, but not only from that paper, we can actually, we were able to re-derive bounds on every single Bell inequality that so far was obtained with information causality and even better. In some cases, we're, we were able to improve these bounds. So on the left-hand side, you see results uh, from a paper by, uh, by, by the, these uh, authors in Nature Communications. It, it was the first issue of the, that paper. When they looked at uh, the same protocol as information causality, but the sender has two numbers which are not uh, bits. There, there are D-level numbers. And these plots show, um, show the bound implied by information causality uh, uh, for various Ds. Uh, uh, this is D equal uh, two with, uh, uh, with circles, D equal five with squares, and D equal 10 with diamonds, and N, is the amount of concatenation levels. So we took this and repeated our, uh, uh, and uh, looked what you can get with exactly the same communication protocol, only one copy of the box, and again, a symmetric channel. And uh, the results are in the table here. So. It's not really important what is in the table. The important thing that E is smaller than E prime. E prime is what you get with concatenation. E is what you get without it. So you can really see that concatenation has really been only a burden to this principle. And now we can get ri rid of it and, uh, and our lives are much better. So um we were extremely happy and uh, we put this paper and uh, in this paper we also mention other applications so on the right hand side i remind you what were the limits uh, on uh, protocols with concatenation and the, the other applications are like this since there are no limits I, information causality can be easily applied to more Bell inequalities. So uh, Nikolai in our paper uh, took uh, I3 3 to two Bell inequality for which we couldn't get any nice bounds. And very quickly with uh, one simple protocol got some highly non-trivial bounds. We're still pretty far from a quantum bound, but um, he could uh, get uh, something uh, non-trivial quite quickly. And if you have one cop just one copy of non-local box that you need and the, and the simple channel, you can actually systematically look for all the possible protocols. So in the future, we intend to do this and uh, we hope to find even stronger bounds. I, actually, I wanted to do this before today's talk and spent uh, the whole weekend trying to do this, but uh, there is something wrong in my code and I keep getting negative probabilities. So as soon as I fix it, I, I hope to be able to say more about this. And uh, one more uh, nice application is that 
since left hand side is replaced by mutual information, uh, you can get bounds on randomness from information causality. Look, if you have uh, some non local box with which some protocols gives you a certain sum of mutual informations, then if you assume that information causality is not violated, then the right hand side of the new formulation has to all, also has to be significantly large. And all obviously mutual information cannot be lower than entropy of any of the variables. And since input to the communication channel is related, uh, exactly how it's related, it depends on the protocol, but it's related with the outcomes of non-local box, then information causality actually gives you a lower bound on Shannon entropy of the outcomes of the non-local box, which is another cool application. And I guess I'm running out of time. So thank you. And um, yes, that's all. Thank you. Ah, now I've unmuted myself. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, so uh, just time for a couple quick questions here. First one is from Remick. Um, can you give an example of a quantity that is, satisfies the four assumptions you mentioned, but that's different from Shannon's mutual information? Uh, no, no, this is uh, the beauty of Shannon's mutual information. So actually, I, 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 I don't know if Shannon did it like this, but uh, in uh, modern uh, information theory textbooks, textbooks you can say you, uh, you can uh, you you just say what are the intuitive principles that you require from entropy or mutual information, and then you get that only Shannon's mutual information satisfies that. So, uh, but. But th this is a, not really a problem here. So what I want to say that if in, in our universe, we can define many meaningful uh, entropies, uh, Remy entropies, Shannon entropies, Salis entropies, and so on. But, the, but what information causality says is that if, you had boxes which violate Cyrilson bound, then you wouldn't be able to meaningfully define Shannon's mutual information in our world. Maybe you could define other measures of information, but certainly not this one. And this one is, uh, well, maybe not the best, but one of the most intuitive. Very good. And so we'll do one more question. Uh, this one's uh, from Miguel. Uh, do almost quantum correlations violate the new principle? Uh, so actually, uh, when I mentioned that I spent a lot of time writing a code, this was my holy grail. I, I found a, a nice probability distribution for which almost quantum and, and this new formulation of information causality gave exactly the same bounds. And while I was trying to uh, improve the protocols, I started getting negative probability. So I, I, I don't have it, but I'm working really, really hard on finding uh, that it is really the case. Gotcha, very good.